Um, welcome everyone to the October instalment of the Guitars Hub webinar series. Um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Nigel Scruton from the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology and Manchester University, um, who will be talking about microbial cell factor factories, sorry I've lost my ability to read, um, and engineering biology for chemical production. Um, I will hand straight over to Nigel, but if you could use the Q&A function to ask questions and we will answer all the questions at the end. If you have any technical difficulties or any issues or would like to introduce yourself and let us know where you're from, please use the chat button. Um, and on that, I'll hand straight over to Professor Scrutton. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for a very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon and for me to be able to tell you about our recent work on engineering biology for chemicals production and biomanufacturing. So what I'd like to do today is to discuss our work on establish, uh, establishing an automated biofoundry for microbial strain engineering and the impact that this is having on chemicals and uh, fuels production. And then how some of this work is now being translated to scale for the commercial production of selected advanced uh, fuels. So really just to provide some context, of course, biomanufacturing is a significant contributor to the UK economy. And we're now on the cusp, I think, of rapid expansion of this sector as we urgently try to find solutions to meet uh, global challenges. For example, the government's uh, clean growth and zero carbon uh, agendas. Um, this is especially important, I think, in the UK chemicals manufacturing sector, uh, which includes over 3000 businesses employing around about 153,000 people and giving something like 19 billion in gross value added to a, a turnover of around about 55 billion. So of course, the majority of this comes from petrochemicals, a fact that's increasingly odds with the Paris Agreement obligations and 80% and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2050. So clearly and urgently, we need to change and transition to a more sustainable biomanufacturing sector as part of the UK's economic recovery as we build back better following the global uh, pandemic. Now, uh, of course, the UK is recognized as a world leader uh, in, in biotechnology, and uh, uh, this is especially true uh, in the research base, which delivers first uh, rate discovery science. <coughs> uh, the UK, however, needs to do better at building back from this science base to implement uh, sustainable biomanufacturing technologies and, and bring them to market. And, and I guess pre-pandemic, the UK produced multiple roadmaps, many of them you see on the slide here, and vision documents to shape future investment in infrastructure, training and science and technology programs to rapidly grow uh, the industrial biotechnology base. And so I guess there's no better time than now to capitalize on these developments, especially as we approach the next UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow in 2021, uh, as we aim to build back better uh, through clean growth. So what I hope to convince you of this afternoon is that at the MIB or the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology, we're developing a research environment uh, to tackle the science and technology challenges of establishing a bio-based manufacturing economy, especially in the areas of fuels and, and chemicals. And over the years, MIB has assembled a strong interdisciplinary research community, uh, working together across the uh, biology, chemistry, materials, engineering, and computational science areas uh, that it really has enabled us to address ambitious challenge-led uh, research programs. And of course, we were delighted to be recognized earlier this year through the award of the Queen's Anniversary Prize, uh, recognizing uh, MIB's leadership in the UK's strategic development of biotechnology and biomanufacturing through innovative technologies in partnerships with industry. Now in MIB, what we've done is to assemble a number of capability platforms uh, that have often been supported by major investments from UKRI and, and industry. And these have provided focal points for the development of new technology platforms for engineering biology and for forming interactions with external groups and industry to help pull through academic discoveries towards industrial application. What I want to do today is focus on two key research areas 
synthetic biology and biocatalysis, but also supported by work we've been doing in the structural and biophysical analysis uh, of enzyme systems. So in 2014, we established SymbiochEM, one of the uh, six uh, synthetic biology research centers uh, supported by the BBSRC as a platform center for the rapid engineering of microbial strains for fine and specialty chemicals based on uh, a bespoke design built test loan platform that we've developed within the center. The chemicals production pipeline starts at the design stage uh, shown in purple here, where we set out blueprints for engineered microbial strains using a suite of design algorithms for rapid strain engineering. These include design tools for retrosynthesis in the cell and the design of extended metabolic pathways to access new chemical space and enzyme selection and engineering tools. We can then design and select DNA parts, combine them into plasmid libraries using automated assembly instructions and high throughput robotics. And the build stage then prepares us for the assembly of these genetically encoded parts and assembles them into plasmids via, for example, ligase cycling reactions, according to automatically generated work lists that drive the laboratory automation. And the fidelity of the sample pathways is then checked, for example, by high throughput restriction analysis and capillary electrophoresis, or by nanopore DNA sequencing. And then the test stage encompasses high throughput methods for the growth of microbial uh, production cultures, automated product extraction and screening via fast liquid uh, chromatography and mass spectrometry. The results are analyzed in the learn stage, the blue shaded panel on the slide, through predictive models using statistical methods and machine learning to inform the next round of design. And after a number of iterations uh, of this DBTL uh, cycle, successful prototypes are then taken forward to process development and scale up. And so in establishing the SymbiChem pipeline, we set out really to achieve a number of objectives. First of all, uh, the pipeline should be agnostic to the target compound that we want to produce and also to a certain extent to the host uh, bacterial organism so that we can support the production of many different chemicals from different host organisms. Secondly, it should leverage high throughput automation to ensure rapid delivery of new strains and this improved performance should also reduce human error in the engineering uh, programs. Third, we set out to provide software, platforms and expertise that could then be readily adopted by the wider synthetic biology community. Now, development of the SymbiChem Biofoundry concept was really phased. In phase one, we focus very much on developing the underpinning capabilities of the pipeline around three target groups of compounds, those being flavonoids, terpenes, and alkaloids as exemplar groups. And then in the second phase, we then tested the pipeline in anger, carrying out a stress test to determine how many uh, materials monomers, for example, that we could produce from biology in a three month window using the SymbiChem uh, capabilities. So in the first stress test, uh, we set ourselves the challenge of seeing how many materials monomers we could produce by engineering E. coli uh, using the pipeline. And in discussions with local material scientists at Manchester, we identified a list of monomer targets used widely by industry and a selection of these targets from the list was chosen based on monomers that were either found in natural biosynthesis routes or ones that are biosynthetic, biosynthetically accessible based on literature information and prospective bioretrosynthetic research. We selected 25 targets encompassing uh, seven uh, compound classes that were either materials monomers or compound precursors. These encompassed uh, vinyl benzenes, allyl benzenes, mandalates, isobutyl compounds, diols, dienes, and carboxylates, uh, each with their own application areas in polymer chemistry. We then set ourselves a notional 90 day limit to walk through the design, build, test, and learn cycle to identify how many unique strains capable of synthesizing these products could be engineered, and also to characterize general properties such as the titers of uh, products in laboratory fermentations, and to identify potential strains that could enter a second DBTL cycle, focused this time on optimizing titers to reach gram uh, per liter levels suitable for large scale production. 
So for each class of chemical target, new synthetic metabolic pathways were selected following the Symbiac M automated approach, which involved the use of retrosynthesis software. Enzyme candidates for each step were selected using our design algorithm cell enzyme and via phylogenetic analysis. And the target compounds and primary metabolite uh, precursors are represented here uh, by a skeletal uh, formula, whilst other E. coli metabolites are represented by abbreviations. Now the continuous arrows on the, on the slide represent a single enzyme step, whereas successive arrows represent multiple enzymatic transformations uh, toward the target uh, compound. So targets successfully produced in E. coli are shown in green. Those in red were from uh, the original target list, but for which enzymatic routes to their production were not found. Orange targets were produced enzymatically in vitro, but not during fermentation of E. coli. And the blue structures identify compounds for which the titer was raised substantially by engineering E. coli, for example, by knocking out competing pathways or by boosting expression of biocatalysts in the cell through further rounds of strain engineering. The entire DBTL engineering cycle was completed in automated fashion within 85 days. Uh, the success of the rapid design and then the engineering of new bacterial strains reveals the power, we believe, uh, of the prototyping strategy uh, of the biofoundry approach in discovering new pathways that can lead to chemical space not naturally found in biology. We subsequently took a small selection of these strains that have been engineered to produce mandalate and hydroxymandalate and put them through a second stress test with the objective of increasing titers to the gram per liter scale. That second stress test was likewise successful, driving titers into the one to 10 gram per liter scale values that are now suitable for consideration of production scale up uh, for these compounds. So if we look at the outcome of the stress test as a simple numbers gallery, uh, we can get a feel for the capabilities of the constructive pipeline. Within the 85 day uh, limit, we designed and created 160 unique genetic parts by DNA synthesis. We constructed and verified uh, by sequencing 187 unique pathway constructs, assembled using our automated ligase cycling reaction methods. We performed over 150 unique enzyme assays, created nine mutant E. coli chassis using, for example, genome engineering methods. And we analyzed more than 8,000 samples uh, using mass spectrometry as part of the integrated test platform. And we developed 22 new MS quantification methods. The outcome is that from a standing, uh, a st a standing starting point, we created prototype strains for 17 out of the original 25 monomers of interest. And we were able to access biologically five out of seven classes of identified monomer types. So overall, we estimate that the personnel and consumable costs uh, amounted to around about 15,000 pounds per successful target, corresponding to 360 uh, personnel hours per, per compound. And this rigorous and comprehensive benchmarking uh, study we feel now showcases the ability of biofoundries to provide quick and affordable access to a diverse range of chemicals by microbial fermentation, and how these early prototype strains can now be optimized and scaled up to achieve gram per liter fermentation as a basis for large scale uh, production. So we've also been interested in exploring biological diversity and chemical diversity using the, the biofoundry uh, approach. And for some time now, we've been exploring terpene chemistry as an attractive playground for microbial uh, chemicals production, as the terpenes group is naturally very diverse with up to around about 80,000 known compounds in, in nature. In the interest of focusing on a subset of these compounds, we concentrated on the monoterpenes, which are C10 compounds made from the isoprenoid precursors, isopentanol diphosphate and dimethylallyl uh, diphosphate. Now, many of these monoterpenes have major industrial applications and are used widely, for example, as flavorings, fragrances, and antiseptics, and are also important precursors for pharmaceuticals, bioplastics, and fuels. And currently, they're obtained from either agricultural sources, uh, which are subject to seasonal uh, uh, variation, crop yields, and, and use land that, frankly, could be better repurposed for, for example, for producing food, or they're synthesized uh, chemically, which in itself is a challenge given their overall complex uh, structures 
and the existence of multiple uh, stereo centers. And this drives up the cost of production and purification of, of the desired uh, products. So we set out to discover if compounds uh, of this type uh, could be made readily using synthetic biology and to create a, a plug and play microbial prototype uh, strain uh, that could produce a vast array of terpenes. And if successful, we were then interested to see if selected strains could be optimized further uh, to support production at scale. So during the early development phases of the Symbiochem pipeline, we, we focused on uh, three chemical groups, as I said previously, terpenes, flavonoids, and alkaloids. Our first demonstration of the pipeline with flavonoids and alkaloids was published in 2018, prior to the material stress test that I mentioned earlier. The terpene work has been progressing over an extended timeline to build up a series of strains and genetically encoded parts uh, to make a vast array of terpenes in engineered microbial strains, some of which are currently being scaled for specific applications with, indus with industry partners. And again, what I hope to do is to convince you that the biofoundries and the engineering of biology provide attractive alternative routes to the production of a range of industrial important chemicals and also potentially expand the chemical reach beyond that easily attainable using synthetic chemistry uh, methods. So on this slide, I, I call this uh, image uh, the monoterpene wheel. It indicates the skeletal structures of all monoterpene uh, scaffolds derived from the precursor isoprenoid shown at the bottom of the, uh, at the, bottom of the wheel uh, shown here. Uh, we can identify uh, three subgroups, the bicyclic monoterpenes, the monocyclic and the acyclic monoterpenes. And our objective was to engineer prototype strains that can make each of these compounds as a basis for further optimization and ultimately scale up for production. The first task was to engineer uh, the feeder pathway that gives rise to uh, common substrates for, for all these uh, terpenes, that's geronyl diphosphate. Uh, we and others have created such pathways using variants of the so-called endogenous MEP pathways, which generally results in low intracellular levels of the isoprenoid precursors, or using a heterologous MVA pathway that we have created and optimized in recent years to balance carbon flux and stability when contained in a heterologous host. After synthesizing these pathways uh, for precursor supply, our objective was then to introduce a library of monoterpene cyclases uh, <clears throat> into the host strain using a plug and play approach to switch on the synthesis of the desired monoterpene product. Now, initially we targeted uh, two to three known plant terpene cyclases for each individual scaffold, taken from a diverse uh, source of, of, of a, a diverse uh, source of different plants in the hope of detecting and quantifying the monoterpene product produced from the engineered strains. This then opens up additional DPTL engineering, for example, to optimize product titers, minimize cytotoxicity of the products, and enable tailoring of the scaffolds to make uh, higher, uh, higher value products. So early designs were relatively straightforward. We set up a two plasmid uh, system with the feeder pathways contained in a single plasmid shown here, uh, uh, and with a, a second plasmid containing geronyl diphosphate, uh, the entry uh, enzyme uh, that is required to form a GDP uh, on which the terpene cyclase can, can then uh, act. Switching in and out of different terpene cyclase enzymes then enables production of different target monoterpenes to be studied. The MVA feeder pathways were engineered and optimized using enzymes taken from multiple organisms, color coded as shown, uh, as shown here, uh, and fine tuning of metabolic flux through this engineered MVA pathway was also achieved through machine learning to affect translational tuning of individual genes using libraries of synthetic ribosome binding sites uh, to boost production titers by over 60% when screening under 3% of a ribosome binding site library. <clears throat> to facilitate library screening, a multi-well uh, plate fermentation procedure was developed, allowing uh, increased screening throughout uh, throughput uh, with sufficient resolution to discriminate between high and low producers. And this early optimization uh, has helped to balance the flux through the MVA pathway when coupled with further engineering has led to the production of stable and optimized plasmic constructs for the production of the required isoprenoid uh, precursors. So what we have achieved is the creation of a first generation library of E. coli strains 
uh, that can make every natural monoterpene scaffold represented in the so-called monoterpene wheel. This then gives us access to a generalized platform uh, of E. coli strains as a starting point for optimization for scale up and also for further chemical tailoring. And to facilitate tailoring, we also uh, generated an extensive biocatalysis toolkit for the oxyfunctionalization uh, of terpenes uh, by designing and building a cytochrome P450 enzyme collection and testing it in a custom made untargeted GCMS metabolomics based approach. We're able to rapidly create and characterize a comprehensive library uh, for the controlled oxyfunctionalization of terpene scaffolds with a wide range of activities and selectivities towards all the monoterpenes shown here. We can now use this novel biocatalytic resource to access the extensive chemical diversity of terpenoids by further pathway engineering through the assembly of biocatalytic cascades to subsequently produce libraries of oxygenated terpenoids and their derivatives for diverse applications. For example, terpene-based drug discovery. So the outcome of the first generation engineering is shown here, both in terms of product profiles and indeed titers achieved for each of the monoterpene scaffolds. We were able to produce more than 30 different monoterpenoids from glucose using 20 different terpene uh, synthases. Several novel scaffolds were generated, not previously produced in engineered microbes uh, before, and initial production levels were exceeded for most uh, where selected examples have been previously produced in engineered microbes. Most terpene synthases, however, produce multiple products, and in particular, complex bicyclic products, where typically only 60 to 70 percent of the total terpene product is of the bicyclic type. Some compounds are produced at very low titers, as we can see here, and examples include uh, targets that we were particularly interested in, linalool and terpinoline. What is striking overall is that the product profile, profiles were generally very complex and multiple products were obtained with, with most cyclases or terpene synthases and a range of product titers were obtained. These were affected by many things, optimizing the pathway flux, enzyme expression, minimizing site product formation and controlling the effects of cytotoxicity are all important uh, factors in, 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 in determining the, the final titer obtained. Uh, and moreover, engineering individual terpene synthases or finding alternative catalysts in nature to give cleaner products is clearly a priority uh, for large scale production of, of these compounds. Now, the reasons for the complex product profiles are found really in the mechanistic details of the mode of action of terpene synthases. Uh, these enzymes initiate the reaction cascade by eliminating the diphosphate of geranol diphosphate shown on the left here. Uh, to form the geranol cation, uh, also shown here in the second, the second uh, structure on, on the slide. This en then undergoes isomerization to form the linolyl and terpenol cations, and at any point along the reaction cave, uh, cascade, these re uh, reactive enzyme intermediates can undergo further chemical reactions, such as intramolecular attack on olefinic double bonds, hydride or protein migrations, and rearrangements to change the structure of the chemical staff, uh, scaffold. Ultimately, the reactive intermediates are quenched by deprotonation or nucleophilic attack uh, by water. Now, hydrophobic residues in the enzyme active site form this rather oily substrate binding pocket. I make the comparison here with an ice cream scoop and that we can mold the active site, but we really give it little uh, chemical identity to specifically position the substrate uh, in, in the active site. This hydrophobic binding pocket protects the cationic intermediates uh, from the uh, undirected attack of water and aromatic residues stabilize the charged intermediates by cation pi interactions. Now these relatively inert active sites means that it's very, uh, there's very little overall sequence similarity between different terpene cyclases with the exception of small fingerprint aspartate rich sequence motifs uh, close uh, <coughs> and, and, and a second short motif which is involved in binding the magnesium cofactors. This lack of overall sequence identity really complicates any attempt at rational design and, uh, of, the, of these enzymes using structure and sequence guided uh, protein engineering. And this is clearly a problem when one has the objective to really tighten up product profiles, uh, for example, for the production of a clean uh, product in our microbial cell factories. Uh, and this is a major engineering challenge for this particular field. 
So given the complex product profiles obtained with many of the natural plant terpene synthases, more recently we switched our attention to mining terpene synthases from bacterial species. And given the poor sequence conservation in the active site, we used a hidden Markov model informatics search of bacterial genome sequences to identify new terpene cyclase enzymes. Using this approach, we've identified 2,167 putative new bacterial terpene synthases using the two fingerprint motifs I discussed briefly on the previous slide. And then we selected multiple examples and characterized their overall activity uh, using, for example, GCMS uh, type analyses. Most were shown to be sesquiterpene and diterpene synthases, and only a few were shown to be monoterpene synthases. That said, we have identified specific linalool and simial uh, terpene synthases. We've gone on to determine their X-ray structures and product profiles and shown these are in fact far superior uh, as catalysts for producing those compounds in, in microbial cell factories compared to the plant enzymes. So we've shown that the bacterial enzymes are simpler in structure uh, and more importantly, give much more restrictive product profiles. Uh, as I say, the bacterial sineal and lineal terpene synthesis not only give cleaner product profiles, but predominantly form uh, a single product uh, in uh, live cell uh, fermentations. It also enables much higher titers to be reached uh, for these particular products uh, in our plug and play uh, platform. Uh, and this then uh, enables us to begin to consider whether we can scale up some of these prototype strains uh, to produce these compounds at gram uh, per litre uh, levels. Okay, so what I hope I've done so far is to show that uh, the biofoundry approach is, is, is certainly useful in rapidly generating prototypical strains uh, that can be then further optimized uh, for uh, larger scale uh, fermentations, uh, but also give you access to chemistry that may be difficult to access using conventional synthetic methods. Uh, 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 and therefore that really uh, demonstrates uh, the power of biology uh, in, in, in rapidly generating a palette, if you like, of different uh, uh, chemical structures uh, from a common uh, from a common scaffold. What I'd like to do now is to change tack a, a little bit uh, and show you how microbial cell factory engineering can also be used to make fuels from biology. Uh, we've worked for the last seven or eight years and continue to do so on the production of liquefied petroleum gas or LPG from engineered microbial strains using fermentative and photocatalytic processes. This is a story that's gone uh, from early strain development to large scale production of, of bio LPG at pilots to demonstrate a scale. And in recent years, the establishment of a fuels from biology company called C3 Biotech that we established, uh, which is currently scaling and commercializing uh, our bio LPG production technologies. So the obvious question, first of all, is why target LPG? Well, first of all, it's, a, it's important to appreciate that LPG varies uh, across the world, predominantly comprises propane, but there are varying amounts of butane and other combustible gases present depending on where you source the gas uh, globally. In the UK, LPG is almost entirely propane in, in composition and its manufacturer is, is clearly from fossil sources. Now LPG is a very clean burning transport fuel, uh, currently around about 22 million tons per annum, and it holds an important position in domestic heating markets used in about 14 million homes worldwide. It's also used extensively in cooking as a non-greenhouse gas refrigerant and also as an aerosol propellant. Uh, there are uh, commercial uh, technologies out there. Neste, for example, have developed a, uh, an energy intensive chemical process for conversion of bio-based uh, glycerol uh, to propane, but as yet a true biological route to LPG uh, has not yet been commercialized. Now, LPG is an excellent fuel. There are low energy costs required for its liquefaction. It's easily transported and it's a non-greenhouse gas. And therefore it compares favorably to other alkane gas fuels, uh, such as methane, uh, which is a, a major uh, greenhouse gas produced from traditional anaerobic digestion uh, plants. So all this combines to make LPG, I think an attractive uh, target for production using microbial cell factories. And that's uh, the journey that we set out uh, to, uh, to, to follow uh, over the last uh, seven, or eight, uh, seven or eight years. Now in thinking about this, I actually think it's, 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 it's worth really reflecting on what is the end product? What do we want to achieve here so that we can uh, begin to uh, think about how we can design the biology to fit, fit the end game as it were. So this is my forward thinking slide. We need to ask, 
uh, what a bio LPG production plant might look like on the long term, so that the engineering and process characteristics and overall economics of setting up and running such a plant uh, can be fed back into early stage microbial strain engineering to ensure that the biology is aligned with the larger scale engineering challenges. Consequently, we've taken a sort of bottom up systems engineering approach to inform the overall design. Clearly feedstock supply is central. We need to be able to target, for example, carbon dioxide or industrial wastes, or perhaps agricultural and food and biomass waste, which are in plentiful supply in the UK. We shouldn't be reliant on fresh water, which is potentially scarce in certain regions of the world, uh, and also adds a, an initial cost uh, burden uh, in, in terms of the operation of, of such a plant. So our processes therefore need to run on seawater or brackish water. Uh, we want to use them out in the field. Uh, we need to obtain, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to be clean and, and carbon neutral. Uh, bio LPG, as I've explained, is, is a clean burning fuel. And distributed manufacture for local use would certainly minimize transportation costs and, and, and further carbon burden. We also require simple downstream processing to mitigate against major costs. So, so by embedding uh, production into the existing infrastructures for production, transport, uh, we, we, we essentially have a, a drop in solution. We need to tailor to different waste streams so we can uh, be used effectively across the globe. And there needs to be a low capex and opex uh, burden across the supply chain for its production use uh, and transport. So these are the sort of guiding principles that, that we're clearly thinking about in terms of developing a biological process for uh, LPG uh, production. So let's return uh, to uh, the, the basic science. Uh, first of all, we need to develop uh, a, a biological route to propane. Propane is not produced in nature. Uh, so there's no existing natural pathways or enzymes that can be repurposed for its scale, uh, for, for large scale production. And uh, so our early inroads were therefore to design new metabolic pathways for its production and to source and engineer enzymes that could use a biologically sourced metabolite and turn that into propane gas. So using the DBTL type principle, uh, we created a new version of the clostridial fermentation pathway to butanol, uh, but crucially adapted it to include newly discovered enzyme, aldehyde deformulating oxygenase or ADO as it's labeled. And you can see that in blue on the, on the right hand panel at the bottom. Uh, and we set about to engineer this to work with short chain aldehyde substrates uh, such as butyraldehyde. Our first target host was E. coli because it's of ease and speed of genetic manipulation as we've shown in the previous uh, stress test with our material monomers, uh, but with a view that any prototypical pathway discovered could then be transferred to a more robust industrial host uh, that could be used effectively out in the field. And so the general approach, the, the early approach is summarized here. We selected a number of known biocatalysts uh, for each individual step in the conceptual metabolic pathways uh, to propane and synthesize the DNA to encode these and assemble them into plasmid encoded uh, uh, pathways in a modular fashion. Using different plasmic combinations, uh, we then explore alternative routes along the pathway as identified by the hatched uh, ellipses shown here. As well as using biocatalysts supplied by nature, we also had to repurpose selected catalysts to improve the target chemistry, especially for the ADO enzyme, uh, which is a slow enzyme that works uh, best with long chain aldehydes. And having assembled these early pathways, uh, we then set out to optimize by switching in and switching out new variants or by eliminating competing pathways through targeted knockout of genes to ensure we direct metabolites to the desired uh, product propane. So repurposing of ADO by protein engineering was, uh, was the first challenge. The enzyme works best with long chain aldehydes. Uh, and to get a molecular view of this uh, uh, and how the substrate sits, we solve the crystal structure of ADO uh, in the presence of its surrogate ligand, palmitic acid, which co-purifies with the enzyme from E. coli. And here you can see that the substrate acts, uh, accesses the active site uh, through a long hydrophobic channel with the carboxyl group uh, being presented to the dion center, which is the, the, the area uh, of, uh, uh, of catalysis. We conjectured that the steric uh, blocking of this channel would exclude long chain substrates and perhaps favor the binding of short chain aldehydes. So a number of single and multiple uh, mutations were, were made the most effective being the replacement of a, a residue alanine 134 for alanine. You can see that in the slide here. You can see the red alanine side chain blocking off that channel. 
and the structure of that variant indicated the design intentions were carried through in crystal structures with shorter chain uh, substrates. We then introduced the, en the engineered enzymes into plasmic constructs where we had assembled parts of the pathway genes leading uh, from the cell metabolite uh, acetyl-CoA through to uh, the final product propane. Fermentation of a 12 hour period at analytical scale then indicated that in fact propane was now generated using this pathway, albeit in relatively small amounts. But despite the low uh, titers, this was the first clostridial like fermentation pathway uh, shown uh, to produce propane gas and it establishes an important proof of concept. The titer is dependent on the metabolic route uh, followed as indicated by the red and the green bars. Uh, beyond these uh, proof of uh, concept studies at lab scale, exploratory five and 400 liter scales have also been demonstrated. Uh, and the low titer uh, is clearly a challenge in part due to the very low activity uh, of ADO. We've engaged in both uh, direct evolution and rational engineering studies of ADO, but improvements in catalytic activity here are hard won and hindered by the fact that we're still unsure what is limiting in the overall catalytic cycle of this intriguing enzyme. So on this slide, you can visualize uh, an airlift fermenter that we developed in C3 Biotech, the spin-up company, to investigate early scale up challenges of, uh, of propane production using the engineered E. coli strains that we produced. E. coli is supported using glycerol from a reprocessing plant uh, and from this uh, movie, which I, I hope uh, works on screen here. Let me just generate, I guess it might not work because I can't access my cursor. Oh, there it is. Uh, from this movie here, you can, oh, I'm not sure it's going to work. Oh, there it is. You can actually see uh, a mixture of propane and other flammable gases burning from this airlift fermenter. Uh, there is propane in there, it's not entirely propane, it's a mixture of, of other flammable gases as well, but I, this really does at least demonstrate a proof of concept uh, that propane can produce uh, to some extent uh, in this larger scale uh, uh, fermenter. There are uh, challenges here. Uh, clearly, this is not a system that we would want to uh, scale at this, at this stage uh, because of uh, the low titers produced, uh, the cost of, of, of setting up sterile fermentations uh, with, with E. coli and many of the engineering challenges uh, that we set out. And in the end, we have decided that in fact, ADO is probably not uh, the ideal enzyme to be supporting uh, short chain alkane uh, production in, in microbial cell factories. So armed with uh, that knowledge uh, that ADO is unlikely to support this large scale production, in MIB, a uh, number of us uh, in, in, in the Institute have been looking at, uh, at other potential uh, 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 enzymes that, that could give rise to flammable uh, fuels. Uh, for example, uh, we've uh, had a, uh, an MIB-wide program on uh, mechanism and structure of a number of enzymes uh, which can be used to produce alkenes, alkanes, and indeed terpene fuels that I've, I've mentioned uh, briefly. Uh, some of those enzymes are, are shown here, but really the game changer for us was the report uh, in Science in 2017 of a new photoenzyme isolated from uh, algae, uh, which using blue light can decarboxylate long chain fatty acids uh, in, into, shorter, uh, into shorter chain uh, alkanes. So within that uh, paper in, in science, the structure of the enzyme was reported by uh, Sorige et al. Uh, and it's provided the, the required insight into long chain fatty acid binding in the active site cleft that could be targeted for rational design uh, towards substrates. A notional catalytic cycle was also presented by these authors involving FAD photochemistry to decarboxylate the fatty acid using excited state flavoring chemistry. And as part of the characterization of the enzyme, uh, we've done uh, further uh, spectroscopic analyses uh, of this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, catalyst uh, to determine its overall uh, reaction mechanism. These studies were reported uh, recently in ACS catalysis earlier this year. In brief, we were able to demonstrate uh, that a red intermediate is formed even under cryogenic conditions. Uh, I, that is below the glass phase transition of, of proteins, implying that the chemical change is not dependent on larger scale protein motion, but the decay of that red intermediate is very much dependent on uh, protein structural change uh, because that only happens uh, at, at temperatures above the glass phase transition. I won't dwell on those studies today, 
Uh, the paper is there if anyone's interested uh, to follow up. We were also able using laser excitation experiments to uh, look at uh, proton transfer uh, and hydrogen transfer reactions associated uh, with the formation and decay of that red intermediate. And we're able to begin to deconstruct uh, the overall reaction uh, mechanism and proton transfer pathways, and indeed identify uh, key residues in the active site. And I point you to the cysteine residue, cysteine 432, uh, that we showed is involved in formation and decay of that particular red intermediate. What that means is that we've been able to advance now uh, our understanding uh, of the overall uh, uh, reaction mechanism. First of all, this conserved cysteine residue uh, is found in all FAP, FAP homologs, uh, FAP homologs that are shown in the sequence alignment here, emphasizing its potential importance to the photochemistry. Uh, that cysteine is close uh, to the FAD cofactor, and we believe it gets involved in the chemistry uh, through uh, uh, a series of uh, hydrogen transfer and electron transfer reactions. Uh, essentially what happens is that following flavin excitation, uh, we then get a homolytic fission uh, of the carbon-carbon bond on the substrate to form CO2 and an alkane uh, radical. And that alkane radical is then satisfied by H atom transfer uh, from this active site cysteine uh, to form a phylate radical species which can transitly form an interaction with the FAD, that's the red intermediate, and then uh, relax back to the resting uh, form of the enzyme. So armed with this knowledge, we now have a clearer understanding of mechanism, and this can be factored into rational engineering of the enzyme uh, specificity. Our strategy is shown here, of course, in classical anaerobic digestion type processes, or indeed other uh, uh, processes derived from widely available uh, biomass, you can uh, get to, uh, volatile uh, fatty acid streams. Uh, we can then think about decarboxylating those uh, volatile fatty acids uh, using a single enzymatic step, uh, using the photodecarboxylase to form propane, isobutane, and, uh, and, and, and butane. So our overall strategy uh, was to uh, go in that particular direction. Uh, but of course, uh, the, uh, the fatty acid photodecarboxylase predominantly works with long chain aldehydes. And our first challenge was really to try and reprofile, if you like, the specificity of that enzyme uh, to work uh, with, uh, with, with shorter chain, uh, with, with shorter chain uh, fatty acids. <clears throat> so we created a, a, a series of uh, uh, mutant constructs uh, informed by uh, the structure. Uh, and you can see on this uh, sequence uh, uh, win win window here, we're able to uh, identify residues which are involved uh, in uh, redefining, if you like, the, the substrate specificity of, of this enzyme. We've generated many uh, variants of, uh, of, of FAP uh, in an extensive mutagenesis cycle. Some are single substitutions or there are multiple substitutions, uh, but we've been able to sort of, uh, if you like, identify a sequence window where key changes uh, can really uh, alter the uh, specificity uh, of um, or, 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 or of this enzyme for short chain uh, for short chain uh, uh, volatile, volatile uh, fatty acids. And we can see some of the uh, screening outputs here. Uh, so here we now have uh, variants which are able to work with both C3 and C4 uh, hydrocarbon uh, fatty acids and, and indeed C3, C4 hydrocarbon uh, blends. That's important because wherever you are in the world, of course, LPG uh, comprises propane, butane, or other uh, short chains, and you might want to fine tune uh, the LPG content depending on uh, the type of, uh, uh, of uh, FAP enzyme uh, that, that, that is used in the microbial uh, cell factory. Now, previously I'd mentioned uh, that uh, most of our prototype work has been done in, uh, in, in E. coli, uh, but really we need to translate that then into, uh, in, into a more robust, um, uh, robust industrial host. So conventional fermentations are, are clearly very costly, both in terms of capex investments and ongoing opex burning costs. Uh, and fermentation typically uses extensive, uh, expensive uh, steel fermenters uh, with monitoring systems. It requires aeration, mixing and, and, and DSP, uh, sterilization costs. And of course, uh, extensive use of fresh, wa fresh water, water. So we have a strong collaboration with George Chen in, in, at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And George is the sort of world leader in terms of using uh, 
uh, uh, extremophiles or halophiles as, as hosts for next generation biotechnology. And we've worked with George in recent years uh, to, uh, if you like, translate uh, much of our uh, chemicals uh, uh, pathways into uh, halophilic hosts. And the beauty of that is that halomonas uh, can use low cost reactors. We don't need uh, sterilization because the high salinity negates sterilization processes. Uh, these strains will grow on seawater. Uh, they will use simple waste carbon sources as, 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 as growth feedstocks. They're genetically tractable and uh, it's already demonstrated to be an, an, an existing robust uh, industrial uh, host. So our early lab scale work looked at propane production with both clean and crude biodiesel media. Uh, you can see that on the slide here. We've been able to show uh, production of propane in halomonas uh, as, as indicated in the top uh, right hand uh, panel. Uh, and what's more, if the variant enzymes are introduced into, uh, <clears throat> well, this is just a, a, further, a, a further description of what I've just described here. You can see uh, the performance here is actually much improved above what we see uh, using our E. coli host, our highest uh, published uh, propane uh, levels are around about 0.2 grams per liter uh, of culture. Halomonas has got a high tolerance to the substrate we use uh, for this photocatalytic conversion. Uh, we can get growth in non-sterile seawater uh, uh, and, and so on and so forth. All the characteristics that you'd want to uh, see beginning to uh, emerge out of this, this, new, uh, this new platform. What's more, uh, we can uh, <laughs> if, we, if we place the, the variant enzymes in, into a photosynthetic organism, such as Sinica cystis, uh, we can also demonstrate propane production from uh, CO2 feedstocks. This therefore opens up the exciting possibility of making gaseous hydrocarbon fuels from CO2s. The titers in this case are lower than what we see in Halomonas. There's clearly rounds of optimization to be done here. But again, we establish uh, an important uh, proof, of, uh, proof of concept uh, for further development of making fuels uh, from CO2. So what I hope I've done is to give you uh, a flavor of the type of trajectory we're, that, that, that we're pursuing both academically uh, and, and in our open access sort of uh, commercial ventures, uh, the, the sort of uh, work that we're doing clearly is much more happening that's commercially sensitive in the company that I can't talk about to, to, today. But what we have done is to demonstrate proof uh, of concept for bio LPG production using engineered uh, microbial cell factories uh, we've performed techno-economics in LCA to inform routes to scale production based on these uh, foundational strains. Uh, and C3 Biotech is now engaged in experimental pilot plant developments to guide scale up and to feed back in, into further iterations of strain engineering uh, to ultimately impact on the economics and productivity uh, of production. I'm conscious that I've probably gone over my time slightly, so I uh, think that is where, where I will finish. But before I do that, I'd like to finish by really thanking many researchers who've contributed to the research programs I've discussed today uh, and funding from various agencies. In particular, I'd like to thank the staff in Symbio Chem Center at Manchester, who've done a lot of the strain uh, automation of the strain engineering, but also in the future BRH, which is a, a second center that's de-risking much of the scale at work. And then people in my own uh, research group who've really pushed the LPG uh, type work, but also important collaborators. We've worked with Patrick Jones at Imperial College uh, on, on this project in the early stages and, and indeed in and some of the uh, Silica Sisters work. And also uh, my good collaborator in, in Beijing, George Chen, uh, with whom we've been doing uh, much of the work uh, with on Halomonas. Funders are, of course, uh, UKRI, uh, but increasingly uh, we have industry funded programs uh, coming from uh, C3 uh, Biotech. Uh, that's where I'll finish and I'm certainly happy to take any questions if people have them. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nigel, for a really excellent talk, a really thought-provoking talk as well, um, especially for me, who's more sort of inorganic engineer than, than bio. Um, really fascinating. We do have a couple of questions already popping up on the, the, the questions. Um, Maria asks, um, or says it's an amazing example of targeted engineering of nature, um, but she'd like to know about the economical viability of the process. Uh, yeah. What the estimation of such a price of the price of such a product and do you still need to purify due to low selectivity and what's the most expensive mm -hmm. in the dbtl cycle yeah okay both of those are excellent questions we, we've done quite a lot of 
early stage techno-economic uh, analysis, uh, particularly for the bio LPG. And you can imagine there we've got a real challenge. LPG is not that expensive. <laughs> uh, and so to have a, a process that's competitive with, uh, with, with existing manufacturing processes is, uh, is gonna be uh, a significant challenge. The answer here, I think, uh, is uh, a micro microbial cell factory just making propane alone or making LPG alone uh, is, not, is not going to compete with cost. But the way forward, I think, is to take an, a, a sort of more integrated biorefinery type approach, but symbify that approach. What I mean by that is to take your, your chassis that makes uh, LPG and also have it to make multiple other products. And we've, we've looked at that in detail in our published paper that came out uh, earlier this year, where we've got different case scenarios. We've done the technical economics and the LCA and other types of approach for up to 10 or 11 different case studies. And as you follow through those case studies, then you can see that you can really bring the cost of manufacture down to the point where it becomes, uh, in our view, uh, economically a viable proposition. Uh, and that's the approach we're taking in the company uh, and, and also the approach that's been used to feed back into further engineering of, of, of the strains. Uh, second part of the question, I think, was to do with the rate limiting step in DBTL. Was that, was that the... What was the most expensive step in the DBTL? Uh, gosh, uh, I think the most expensive step is staff resource, if I'm brutally honest, and, and, and the <laughs> capital investment is setting up the platform. Uh, in, in terms of consumable running costs, I, I think that's really hard to... to, to deconstruct. I, I think, uh, you know, as you can imagine, a platform of this type takes a lot of expensive equipment and just running and maintaining, you know, multiple mass spectrometers, robotics, so on and so forth is a constant manager's nightmare in terms of finding money to make sure that that, 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 that is kept up and working. Uh, so actually, I think that's where the, the, real, the real cost is, that and staff resource, um, consumable costs uh, uh, and, and time um perhaps less so thank you i hope that answers your question maria stephen wallace would like to ask um he, he, or he thanks you for a great talk and says he was just wondering how photoactive your decarboxylase is when it's inside a cell and also inside a fermenter yeah that's a really good question too because as, as you know the challenge we have with any photoactive system is light penetration into the cells uh, uh, and that's going to be an engineering challenge moving forward. Uh, we're aware of that. We've done some scoping experiments at lab scale to try and try and tackle with that. Certainly in a lab uh, scale fermenter, one litre, half a litre, uh, we, can, uh, we can show that we can drive the reaction in live cells. Uh, the problem of working with the photobiocatalyst is that in the excited state, the enzyme's pretty unstable. Uh, uh, the, the, the chemistry is... is reactive chemistry. So actually your enzyme undergoes inactivation pretty quickly, even in a live cell. So you have to constantly regenerate your, your biomass to recover the catalyst. It's a bit like you do in the, in the chemical industry. You make a catalyst, it gets poisoned, you've got to remake it. Uh, the good thing about biology is remaking that catalyst is not that expensive. You just regrow the bugs. Uh, so there are a number of issues we have, to, we have to deal with here. Light penetration is one, regenerating catalyst is the other. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Stephen also asks, what do you think the future role of traditional synthetic chemists will be as strain engineering becomes more and more routine and we gradually move away from petrochemicals? Well, I gotta be careful what I say here. <laughs> you, you, you can probably tell by, I, I, I'm passionate about, you know, what the role for biofoundries is, but it's complementary to what we, what we achieve uh, using conventional uh, synthetic approaches. There'll always be chemistry that biology can't do, uh, but there might also be chemistry that biology do that chemistry can't do. So, you know, I, I really see this as a twin track approach, really, uh, uh, and getting a, a closer tie into developing uh, programs or processes in which synthetic biology uh, is part of the is part of the journey. I think is an important thing. Let me give you an example. Synthetic biology is really good at making carbon scaffolds, as I showed you today, terpene scaffolds tailoring those scaffolds through very precise oxyfunctionalization or, or, or further additions might either be a synthetic chemistry challenge or it might be a, a sort of wholesale or, or purified biocatalysis type, the sort of thing we do in the UK biocatalysis sort of theme of the, of the catalysis hub. So I don't think any of these things are exclusive. They have to be integrated as part of a sort of hybrid 
work stream moving forward. But I think Symbio can certainly make uh, scaffolds uh, very effectively and cheaply. Okay. Hope that answers your question, Stephen. Um, Kulas Seskrans, Karan, sorry, I pronounced that really badly, I'm sure, um, asks, uh, did you manage to ex express, difficult to express membrane bound cytochrome P450 enzymes in E. coli, which are part of these processes? Uh, so we stayed away from membrane bound sort of more mammalian type eukaryotic P450s. Uh, and we, uh, and everyone knows who works on P450s that, that, that working with membrane bound systems is, is, is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, and, and in fact, probably one of the reasons why P450s are not widely exploited in, in, in conventional industrial biocatalysis. We tend to concentrate on uh, mutant and variant forms of bacterial systems which are well characterized, P450CAM, P450BN3, those sort of enzymes. There are many variants now available from labs all over the world. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the sort of repository of enzymes that we used uh, for the basis of that work. Um, Having said it, we were able to find catalysts that, 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 that could really oxyfunctionalize at all different uh, positions of, of the terpenes that we, that we discussed. Um, Bill Stibbs would like to know, is there a market for bio-based short chain fatty acids? Uh, I'd like to know that for obvious reasons. Uh, and if anyone knows a market for short chain smelly uh, volatile acids, uh, then please let me know, drop me an email. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Uh, I'm sure there is, uh, but uh, I don't quite know the details of that. So if anyone's got any insight, please let me know. Okay. <laughs> Ewan McDonnell would like to uh, thank you for the talk and ask, um, is there a place for multi-species strain communities of bacteria to improve stability, act in synergy and mitigate species strain specific weaknesses for large scale fermentation biosynthesis as opposed to stringer, singular strains such as the DBT cycles? I, I think the answer to that is, is yes, very likely, very probably for a variety of reasons, uh, shuttling intermediates out of one uh, or, well, first of all, getting a complex metabolic pathway to work in a single host is, is, is probably quite difficult. Uh, there's, there's a real challenge in terms of the engineering and biology that you have to do, making two smaller strains that communicate with each other to perhaps uh, share the products of one as a substrate for another uh, is, is an obvious strategy. There are many other strategies that, 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 that might require you to, to work with multiple uh, organisms. Uh, so in short, yes, uh, I could probably talk for another half hour on the sort of <laughs> application areas where that might be the case that's probably not appropriate for today but certainly yes I think multi multicultures are are, are 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 certainly on the cards. Okay. Um, Mohamed Javed would like to know uh, does are terpenes produced in the engineered E. coli with growth or is it produced as a secondary metabolite in the stationary phase? Yeah. Is the, um, the gram yeah, uh, I don't have hard data to show you on that, but uh, certainly in early stages of growth, uh, a lot of the strategies we use in the lab are, are, are classical, sort of what the molecular biologists would know, get your biomass up and then induce uh, and, and switch on your, your chemistry. Uh, I think at an academic level, that's what we would do. Uh, so you tend to sort of get production toward the end of the growth cycle when you're approaching station phase. Clearly in a more industrial context where you don't want to be using in, in, inducible promoters, you might be working off more constitutive promoters that don't require induction. Uh, you, you might have a different regime. Uh, many of these compounds, however, are cytotoxic. So you've also got to get that balance right as well. You don't want to make it too early so that you, you start interfering with your biomass accumulation. So it's a bit of a fine balancing act, if, if I'm honest, and we're exploring many of those uh, different regimes uh, in, in some of the scaling work that we're doing. He does ask, what is the yield gram per gram per, sub, uh, gram per gram of substrate? Uh, I do, well, again, it depends which product you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I don't have that data for, for the terpene prototype pathways. Uh, mainly because we haven't determined that accurately. I think these are prototype strains, the ones I talked about today. We have to go through optimization processes before we start looking at stoichiometries of conversion. We have done that sort of work for 
our LPG work. Um, I'm not sure I want to sort of share some of that data with you at this stage because there's some commercial sensitivity, but we, we have done some of that uh, work with some of our adapted strains. We have a, an anonymous question, which is, will such synthetic biology synthesized substances get rejected by the public in the same manner as GMOs? If so, how can we conv convince people yeah. to say? <clears throat> well, the, the hope is not, uh, and, and the lesson has to be learned. And of course, when Synthetic Biology Research Councils and, and other funding came into this from the government injection in 2014-13, uh, then that was clearly very much on the uh, on the agenda, uh, and research councils quite rightly uh, were uh, determined that that conversation should happen early on, uh, so that we could de-risk uh, the acceptability of the engineering that we're doing uh, within the centres. So in the Manchester centre, we, we we have great leadership in this space from uh, someone called Phil Shapira, who has driven really quite a lot of the. Uh, responsible research innovation work in the center and, and offered some leadership nationally in that as well. Uh, we hope that those sort of conversations will, will, will prevent another GMO uh, situation backfiring on the, on the symbio world. Um, thank you. Chris Newman, thanks for your talk and asks, how far away are you from a commercial production of a monoterpene? Can't tell you that, I'm afraid. Too, too sensitive. Um, <laughs> Watch this space. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. <laughs> Adam Winifreth asks, um, oh, so he's a biochemistry undergraduate and was wondering what skills you would encourage um, for him to learn if he wanted to get involved in bioengineering. That's a tough one. And I think, you know, there's a lot of skills. I mean, it really is, truly is an interdisciplinary uh, uh, challenge. Uh, and, and it's exciting for, PG students who want to sort of work in this space. Uh, but, you know, you really have to sort of be agile and you've got to be prepared to sort of jump in at the deep end. I mean, I, I know I trained as an enzymologist, but I, you know, I don't know where I am these days. I mean, some, some would say a jack of all trades, master of none. That's probably quite right. Uh, because, you know, we, we dabble in so much different stuff. And, and I think you have to do as a synthetic biology, you have to do some of the, you know, some of the computational design work. You've got to do the, the analytical chemistry strain engineering, the underpinning molecular biology. Uh, there's lots of uh, conventional chemistry involved as well. It's a, it's, it's a big ask for any, anybody uh, training. So I would say, you know, look around at the training opportunities that you have. Uh, we think we do it pretty well in the MIB. I'm sure the centers do it equally well. It's just that, you know, you need to find that sort of environment that supports it. Yeah. Um. Um, there, were, there was an understood from Chris Newman. Um, Govind, oh no, sorry, uh, Govind says, um, "Hello, Manas is indeed a good host for PHB. Was further path was the pathway further engineered for diverting flux from PHB to propane? Also, sorry, I missed how you store the propane in a lab environment. Thank you. Yeah, so I can't tell you anything about the details of the engineering because again, there's there's sensitivities, I'm afraid, uh, in, in that process. I apologize for not being able to sort of give details. Uh, recovering propane from live cell bioreactors is relatively straightforward. Of course, it's a gas, so you don't have the same problem you have with other biofuels, which are either stuck in the cell or stuck in the liquid uh, of the reactor. It comes off as a gas, so you can just do simple liquefaction. Uh, it's standard technology in the propane industry. Uh, my business partner is in the propane industry. He knows how to do that. So uh, we have an instant network uh, of, of expertise that we can draw on to, to, to help us do it. Okay. Uh, and Jordi asks, um, is there any opportunity to make more valuable bioproducts upstream from propane, for example, acrylic acid? In principle, yes. Uh, you know, as academics, of course, we're looking to derive value from existing pathways that we have uh, in our centre, Symbiochem and indeed in, uh, in future BRH. A lot of the sort of initial pathways that we've developed, we're looking to derive value from them by, you know, we call them our gateway pathways because they open up then routes to, to other close by chemicals of value. Um, so we've done this recently with flavonoids, for example, our initial entry pathway there was elaborated further to make, um, you know, different types of flavonoids. So, 
yes, in principle, absolutely. There's there's always that opportunity, uh, and it's relatively straightforward to do that. Well, I think you can tell from the the, the width of the questioning, it was a, a very well received talk. Um, I think we've come to the end of the questions now. Um, I'm sure all the, the participants are, are clapping at their screens and saying thank you very much for such a, an inspiring talk. And I'd like to say thank you very much for giving up your time to give us this talk. It's been excellent. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it and I hope people have got something to take away with them. So uh, thank, you thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I hope to see you next month for our next webinar. Um, lots of thanks on the chat. I will end the meeting and um, the recording will go up on the website once it's been processed. Okay, thanks. Very Bye. Much.